Bible this morning, if you would please, to Psalm 37, the 37th Psalm, please. Psalm 37. We are going to read the first nine verses of Psalm 37. And we've heard the verses responsibly. We begin together on verse 1, then I'll read 2 and alternate like that till we end together on verse 9. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the Scripture, all of us standing to read God's Word. And let's begin on verse 1 of Psalm 37. Ready? Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass, and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord, and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger, and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. And let's pray together, shall we? Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture here this morning. And I pray, God, that you would continue to prepare our hearts and make us ready to receive your word today. 
Do help us, Lord, to focus now and to give our undivided attention to you. Lord, I'm praying your blessing on the special now. I pray as it's sung that we would think about thee and that, Lord, you would tune our heart to your heart today, that we would all have ears to hear what the Spirit would say to us this morning. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. O oh, soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior, and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Through death into life everlasting, he passed and we follow him there. Over us no, no more hath dominion, for more than conquerors we are. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. His word shall not fail you, he promised. Believe him and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying, his perfect salvation to tell. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory. Now, our Father, we bow before you in prayer as we come to the preaching of your word this morning. I want to thank you for the Bible. Thank you, Lord, for preserving your word that we hold copies in our hands this morning. <clears throat> Lord, I pray that each of us would give our attention to your word, not as just the words of a man or the words of men, but as it is in truth, the words of God. And they would have authority in our life today. And you would take the truth that we look at this morning from your word and the promises that we have from you, and we would live them out in our lives. We would truly be vessels of honor unto our God, or your children that you could look down upon and be very pleased. And so, Father, guide and direct in this message. Help me as I bring the truth. Help me to be clear. Help it to be easy to be understood. And then put the truth into the hearts of your people as only you can do. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. <clears throat> I was going to talk to you this morning on the four F's of the Christian army. Most of you know, um, when you are apply to go into the military, you can be 4F. If you remember, that's a wonderful life. Uh, George Bailey couldn't get into the military because he saved his brother's life when they were little by jumping into the pond. And... Um, and he lost a hearing in his ear. 
And so he was 4F, meaning you're not acceptable for service in the armed forces due to medical, dental, or other reasons. What you may not know is that that term 4F originated in the Civil War. And that term was used to disqualify army recruits who did not have four front teeth to tear open the gunpowder packages. <laughs> Amazing the Bible you learn when you come to church, isn't it? The deep truths right there. And they would be classified as 4F. And so while 4F will keep you out of the service of our country, the opposite is true with service for our Lord. You need four F's in order to participate and to be effective in the Lord's army or in the Christian faith. And I want to share those with you this morning. Notice the first one in Psalm 37 and verse 1. In fact, it's the first two words of Psalm 37. What are they, church? What are they, church? Fret not. You see it in fret not. And you see it again in verse 8, cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. And you, you, you see that repeated over and over about not fretting. All, the whole Psalm 37 is dealing with the happy state of the godly and uh, the short-lived prosperity of the wicked. In other words, he's saying, don't, don't you worry, don't you start fretting uh, over the prosperity of the other guy who maybe knows that the Bible says who prospers in his way. Not God's way, his way. And you look and think, man, I, they never have any trouble. They don't love God, they don't serve God, and man, they just seem like they got anything they want and do whatever they want and never seem to have any setbacks or problems. And, and But what Psalm 37 is remind us, reminding us of is God is the righteous judge. God will even everything out. And, and the truth is, God has the last say. Don't worry. Don't fret. That's another way to say stop worrying. Worry never solved a problem. Worry never paid a bill. Worry never alleviated a pain. Worry never made an enemy a friend. Worry never turned a wrong into a right. Worry is the interest paid by those who borrow trouble. And sometimes they're the troubles of tomorrow and they never arrive anyway. Much of what we worry about never happens. Someone said this, The worry cow could have lived till now if she'd only saved her breath. She feared the hay wouldn't last all day, so she choked herself to death. Okay? Dr. G.C. Robinson of John Hopkins University said this hospital said, Personal worry is one of the principal causes of physical ailments which send people to hospitals. Out of 174 patients, 140 were worrying patients. 115 had worries directly related to their physical ailments. He said, we do not know exactly why it is that worriers die sooner than non-worriers, but that is a fact. But I, who am simple of mind, he says, think I know. He said, we are inwardly constructed in nerve and tissue, brain, cell, and soul for faith and not for fear. God made us that way. So for us to live by worry is to live against reality. I'm inwardly fashioned for faith, not for worry, not for fear. Fear is not my native land. Faith is my native land. And so, worry and anxiety are the sand in the machinery of life. Faith is the oil in the machinery of life. I live better by faith and confidence in God than by fear and doubt and anxiety. In fear and anxiety and worry, I gasp for air. I gasp to breathe because they're not my native air. But in faith and confidence, I can breathe freely. These are my native air. You know, a Christian who worries is a very poor testimony. 
When we're constantly worrying or complaining or, or talking about how we don't know where it's going to happen or that's going to happen or what if this goes on or what if that happens, we are a poor testimony that God is going to take care of us. That God is going is in control of our life. That, that maybe God's unable to cope with my problems. And by the way, that's, that's, why, that's why we don't, as a church, we don't uh, have a, a Saturday morning breakfast for the community to be a fundraiser to help support missionaries. Or to help support this part of the church. Because what we're telling the community is, we can't, God can't take care of our needs. God can't support what we want to do. We need your help. Now, three of us think that way. You see, we're, ever, we're sending the wrong message. We're saying the message that God can't take care of us. Oh, no. We ought to see, listen, it, 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 it's the, it, you ought to see the faces of some of the inmates when they ask about, well, well how big is your church? And we tell them, we have about 120, 130 on Sunday morning. They say, you're kidding. And you, and you guys, they, they just can't believe that you do what you do. Well, that's the way it should be because it's not us doing it. It's God doing it. And, and God ought to get the glory and God ought to get the praise. But we ought to say, but the, the message ought to go out is, hey, God can provide for His people. God can take care of His own. We don't worry. We don't fret about that. My God's big enough to take care of us. Now how do you break a worry habit? How do you break a worry habit? Just three simple things to kind of help you with this. That would be a whole message probably in itself. But number one, live one day at a time. Jesus said, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So often we, we spend our time worrying about something that isn't going to happen anyway. And we get all upset and all worried and all, oh, no, I don't worry, I just get concerned. You, you can call that dog a horse, but it's still a dog. And you change the name, but it's still it is what it is, okay? And, and so, it, just, just say, I'm living today. I'm, I'm not going to be worried about tomorrow. You know, I don't know, listen, I don't know about tomorrow, but I know the one who does. And so I just keep my faith and confidence in God. Number two, <clears throat> the way you can break the worry habit is to lift somebody else's burden. Forget about what you're worried about or what you're concerned about or what you're thinking about. And you know what? Go help somebody else carry their load. Go, go brighten someone else's day. Get involved helping somebody else. Bear somebody else's burden. You'll find out that your burden gets lighter. And the third thing you do is you trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. Jesus put it this way. He said, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known unto God. What am I saying? You give it to God. You better just give it over to Him. Let Him carry the burden. You don't have to. And I don't have to. It's, it's the, old, the old fella. I, I love the illustration. And, it, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it, 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 I enjoy telling it. The, the fellow who's hitchhiking with his sack of potatoes over his shoulder. And the fellow stops, says, come on in. Ask him where he's going. He says, well, I'm heading that way. Just throw your potatoes on the back seat. And we'll give you a ride. And he starts chatting and he looks over and the guy still has a sack of potatoes over his shoulder. He said, just throw your potatoes in the back seat. We'll be there soon. And they keep talking. He looks over and he's still got his potatoes. He said, what's the matter with you, man? I told you to put your potatoes in the back seat. And the fellow said, it's nice enough for you to give me a ride. I don't want you to carry my potatoes too. Okay? Now, you, you think that's silly, you know? Does it make any difference to the car? Whether the potatoes are on his shoulder or in the back seat? No. But it'll make a big difference to him. Whether he puts them in the back seat or whether he holds on to them. You know something? Doesn't make any difference to God at all whether you cast your cares, your worries, your concerns on Him. Doesn't we won't even notice it. But you will. You will. Whether you're still holding on to it. Will you, will you give them to God? How do you do that? By prayer. Take your burden to the Lord and do what? Leave it there. 
You don't take it to the Lord and then pick it up and leave with it. Okay? You give it to God and let Him carry the load. That's how you fret not. The first F you need is fret not. The second F is in Isaiah 41 and verse number 10. You're probably familiar with the, the, the passage and, and particularly with this verse, you're probably familiar with it because of a hymn uh, that we sing. Isaiah 41 and verse 10. The Bible says in 41.10, For fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. I says, now the first one was fret not. This F is fear not. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Fear is a very close relative to worry because they, they both paralyze you. They both debilitate you. And many people today live in bondage because they live in fear. And I'm reminded of what Paul told Timothy, who, which would need to be encouraged as a young pastor and as a young Christian, that God has not given us the spirit of fear. And how many times we can catch ourselves saying the words, well, you know, I'd like to do this, but I'm kind of afraid this might happen. I'm kind of afraid if I do that, this will happen. And, and what I've been thinking about it, we're, we're, we're saying what the problem is. I am afraid. What is that? Fear. And here he said, fear not. And people fear all sorts of things. People fear death. They fear sickness. They fear failure. They fear poverty. They fear being alone. They fear germs. There's all kinds of phobias that people have. I'm not even sure I can pronounce all of the phobias. I've got a few that I listed here. There's a phobia of the fear of baldness or bald people. Were you, were you afraid when Xavier sang this morning? There's the fear of drafts. The fear of color, the color purple. There's the fear of hairy people. You're safe there, brother. Amen. <laughs> The fear of writing in public. There's a, then there's a phobophobia. The fear of fear. I was reading when I was preparing this message that President and Mrs. Benjamin Harrison were so intimidated by the newfangled electricity installed in the White House, they would not touch the light switches. So if there were no servants around to turn off the lights when the Harrisons went to bed, they slept with them on. Fear. The great enemy of the human race. It inhibits us. It cripples us. It, it makes us into spiritual midgets. Not fit for the Lord's service. Fear is the great enemy to faith. <clears throat> Moody. Look in your Bible at Psalm 56. Psalm 56, please. D.L. Moody said some folks go to heaven second class instead of first class. You say, what in the world does that mean? Well, look at Psalm 56. I'll point out what he was speaking of. He said second class people were those who took Psalm 56 and verse number 3, where he says, what time I'm afraid, I will trust in thee. Either that's your second class citizen. The first class citizens say this, verse number, verse number 11. In God I have put my trust, I will not be afraid of what man can do unto me. So the, the, the second class is, I'll be afraid, then I'll trust in God. But the first class is, I'll go ahead and trust in God first, and then I won't be afraid. That's the way to be. That's the way to live. And that's how you conquer the fear. I will, in God, I have put my trust or my faith. Someone said, fear is the father of cruelty. The rattlesnake strikes, the dog bites, the cat scratches when they are in panic of fear. The same is true when a man kills. It's often because of panic of fear. 
Fear robs the soul of sunshine and it turns the optimist into a pessimist. The world is living in fear and they try to drown their fears. They try to forget their fears. And what do they do for that? Oh, they do alcohol. They do drugs. They do pleasure. They work harder. They try to get more wealth. They try to build up money. Some even turn to spirituality. Not not Christianity, but spirituality as the world would say spirituality. But Jesus says, fear not. Now why, why would we as believers not have to fear anything in life? And can I tell you? Because Jesus is with us. The psalmist said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no... Why? For thou art with me. He said, I don't have to fear any evil because you're with me. Now, listen, not only do we not fear because He's with us, but we don't have to fear it because He's already gone before us. He's already been tempted at all points like we are, yet without sin. He's already been there. We don't have to fear because He's already experienced it. He's already been there ahead of us. I don't have to fear death. Why? He's already been there. He conquered death. He conquered the grave. He rose again. There's a resurrection. Because He lives, I too shall live. So shall you. So I don't have to fear eternity, for He inhabits eternity. You see, the remedy, that's the remedy for fear. Faith in God. Trust in Him. Have confidence in God. Faith in His presence. Faith in His power. Faith in His provision. Faith in His promises. Fear not. So we have two of the four F's. We have fret not and we have fear not. What are the first two? Fret not and fear not. The third one is found in the New Testament, Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. Jesus is speaking to His followers. He's speaking a parable to them about prayer. And He says in Luke 18 and verse 1, He spake, that's Jesus, a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to what? Faint. Faint not. Galatians 6 verse 3, In due season we shall reap if we faint not. Faint means to lose heart. Faint, simply put, means you give up. The Bible has much to say about being persevering or being faithful. Whether it's regard to prayer or any endeavor we take on for God. Charles Spurgeon said, The snail reached the ark by crawling one centimeter at a time. Perseverance. Did you know Noah Webster? I, I like to use the Webster's 1828 dictionary and look up Bible words. It's closer to the Bible times. And often in his definitions, he gives Bible verses uh, to support the definitions. Noah Webster labored 36 years writing that dictionary. Sometimes I, I, I've read that and I thought, man, how did he come up with this? I mean, how did you do this? You know what? 36 years of his life he did. Leonardo da Vinci worked on the painting of the Last Supper for ten years. Often so absorbed in his work that he would forget to eat for days. Adam Clark, who wrote a commentary on the whole Bible, took 40 years to write that commentary. William Carey, as many of you know, labored for seven years before he led one person to Christ in Burma. India, I believe. William Wilberforce, who helped end slavery in England, was discouraged one night in the early 1790s after another defeat in his ten-year battle against the slave trade in England. Tired and frustrated, he opened his Bible and began to leaf through it, and a small piece of paper fell out and fluttered to the floor. It was a letter written to him by John Wesley shortly before his death, and Wilberforce read it again. The letter said, quote, Unless the divine power has raised you up, I see not how you can go through your glorious enterprise in opposing that abominable practice of slavery, which is the scandal of religion 
of England and of human nature. And unless God has raised you up for this very thing, you will be worn out by the opposition of men and devils. But if God be for you, who can be against you? Are all of them together stronger than God? Oh, be not weary of well-doing. Go on in the name of God and in the power of His might. And he did go on. And he got slavery defeated in the land of England. How many of you in here ever fainted? Anybody ever fainted? My hand's not up, by the way. I never have. Some of you have fainted. You've seen sometimes the funny wedding videos where you see somebody standing up at the wedding and all of a sudden they keel over, you know. And uh, there's, I, I, I was reading this and again studying on this that there's, medically speaking, fainting will occur when not enough oxygen gets to the brain. But there's many things that can bring that on. A few of them are this. This isn't an uh, exhaustive list, but here's a few things that can cause people to faint. I want you to think about this. Number one is a wrong diet. Our body requires certain nutrients. And if we don't, we won't get those if we don't eat a good balanced diet. Eating the right foods in the right proportions. You eat too many sweets and starches and your blood sugar will shoot up. Too much food with high amounts of acid will give you stomach problems. The reason many Christians faint is right there. They don't have a very good spiritual diet. They don't take care of themselves and feed themselves properly. They're not eating the right food. You think, well, I'll come and listen to an hour of the Bible or a half hour of the Bible on Sunday morning. Of course, I, I took in about 20 hours of television this week. Well, what, what, you wonder why we faint? Wonder why we get weary? The Bible says the Word of God is here to give us the strength and the stamina we need. It's, it's the meat of the Word, the milk of the Word, the water of the Word, the honey of the Word. It's, it's everything we need for a balanced diet is found in the Word of God. And, and so that's why you need the Word of God, not just on Sunday. You need the Word of God every single day of the week. And you will keep yourself from fainting. You'll get the nutrients you need to continue on for God. You can't feed on the soap operas and the primetime television and then wonder why, how come you fall apart when a difficulty comes. Well, there's no secret to that. You fall apart because you've been feeding on the wrong things and you're weak spiritually. The pastor went to visit a family and the woman, the lady of the house wanted to impress the pastor and so she looked at her little five-year-old boy and said, now Johnny, go run get the book we all love so much. And Johnny returned with the TV guide. Didn't work out like she thought it would. So many Christians today, it's sad, but so many Christians today, you can have conversations with them about the weather, our sports, our news, our politics, but you can't have any conversation with them about the Bible, about spiritual things. They just shy away from talking about the Bible. My friends, that's a shame. The command in the Scripture to study, to show ourselves approved unto God, that's not written to pastors. That's written to believers. That's for all of us. Are you showing yourself approved to God? Oh, that's, I, I don't have any time to do that. You know what I found out? I have time to do what I really want to do. I have time to do what I really want to do. And what I don't really want to do, I can find an excuse. Amen, Pastor. Thank you. You're welcome. If you deprive your soul of the spiritual nutrients you need, you will faint. You'll faint in the... If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. And you get strength from the Word of God. The second reason, another reason that people faint is they get overheated, get too warm. Working, working too hard or going too hard without ever taking time to rest. 
And you know, you, you, even the, the Lord looked at the disciples one day and said, I want you to come apart and rest a while. I want you to be able to take some time to, to recharge. If the Lord took time to have some recess, as you will, my favorite subject in elementary school, and uh, if He took time for recess, then it's okay for you and I to have some time for that. It's okay. And that's good for us. We need our time of drawing aside and just resting with Him and spending time with Him. When He called the, 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 70, or the, the 12 to go out, and I think it's in Mark 14, uh, verse number 3, I believe, it says He called them, and, and when He says, I, He called them to be with Him and to send them out to preach. And we sometimes focus on sending Him out to preach, but that's the second part. The first part was He called them that they might be with Him. And, and don't get, if all you do is go out for Him and never spend any time with Him, you'll faint. I heard one time a preacher and, and somebody who you would know, Brother Yoder, say that the average life of a soul winner is about three years. Well, why is that? Because once you go, 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 and you don't spend any time with Him, that's about all longer you'll last in your strength. Hmm? You spend time with Him. It's so natural. When you're with Him and you're aware of His presence, if, if um, um, Brett here, give her your Bible, would you? If Brett here, now use your imagination, okay? If Brett here is Jesus, <laughs> all right? He's got a beard, okay? He's, he's, he's getting there. Come on up, stand up here. And I, my first calling, your first calling is to spend time with Him. Now, we're, we're with Him, and by the way, He's with me always, and He's with you always. And so, I'm aware. Most of the time, what, we're, what we fail at is being aware that He's with us. But when I spend time with Him, when, I, when you close your Bible in the morning, after you have your devotions, you read the Bible, you pray, you talk to Jesus... When you go, does he stay back there? No, he's coming with you. Okay? So as I go about my duties that day, who's with me? And so I'm going about my duties and I meet this guy on the street. Hey, I'm Brother Slayball. What's your name? Danny Wright. Oh, Danny, good. Nice to meet you. And we start, boy, beautiful day, isn't it? And uh, he starts talking. Now, what's the natural thing I should do? Yeah, and he might even say, if, if he was visible, now he is, but Jesus isn't. <laughs> the natural thing for him to be say, who's your friend? And, and the truth is, hey, fellas, you ever meet somebody who you knew, and your wife was with you, and she didn't know him, and you say, hey man, good to see you, and you talk for a few minutes, and then you say, hey, we'll talk to you later, and you walk away, and you never introduced her? You probably have never done that. But I, I knew somebody once who did that. Won't mention any names. <laughs> and uh, say, why didn't you introduce me to him? What, what's the problem? Yeah, that's the problem. What do you think? How many times have you walked away from somebody and Jesus would say, why didn't you introduce him to me? Amen. Why didn't you tell him about me? That's just a natural thing to do. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. If I'm aware of his presence. Yeah. If I've spent time with him, then I'm aware that he's there. And, and, it's, and, and you keep a conversation going with him and it's just natural to include him in on the conversation mm -hmm. and tell him about Jesus. Amen? Amen? Thank you, Brad. So we're not going to faint by getting the right nutrients. We're not going to faint by not getting overheated but taking time to be with the Lord. And then the third reason people can faint is inactivity. Inactivity. Most of the time when you stay in one position too long, that's where the wedding faints come in, I think. They're standing up platform and it's getting kind of lengthy and, and, and their knees are locked up and pretty soon over they go, staying in one position. You ever, you ever been laying down for a little bit of time and you got up too fast? Hmm? And get, get lightheaded? And you say, whoa, whoa, got up too fast. Better, better, better sit down here for a minute. Uh, you could faint if that happened. If you don't exercise for a long time, and you just get up and say, I think I'll just get up and run a couple miles. Yeah, you're going to get lightheaded. You're going to get dizzy. Again, I don't, I don't know that from experience. I'm just <laughs> relaying that to you, okay? 
I heard about that. And, uh, but you know what it does? When you stay busy for God, when you keep exercising yourself for God, you keep yourself in good spiritual condition. And you don't faint. You don't faint. Fear, fret not. Fear not. Faint not. There's one more. There's four F's, remember? All right, the last one is this, Psalm 103. Psalm 103. Are you okay? This is the last point. You can put your tray tables in the upright position. We're coming in for a landing. Psalm 103. Psalm 103, notice with me verse number 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and, what's the next two words, church? Forget not all His benefits. Oh, don't forget God's blessings. And boy, He mentions them as He goes through the 103rd Psalm and all the things that God has done for us. So often we, we can get into the land of forgetfulness. And we forget to thank God for His goodness. Remembering keeps you humble. Remembering will keep you grateful and thankful for where you've been and what God has done for you. He brushed his teeth twice a day. The doctor examined him twice a year. He wore his boots whenever it rained or snowed. He slept with the window slightly opened. He stuck to a diet with plenty of fresh fruit and vegetables. He golfed for exercise, but never more than 18 holes, and he walked it. He didn't ride a cart. He got at least eight hours of sleep every night. He never smoked, drank, or lost his temper. He exercised every day. He was all set to live to be a hundred. His funeral would be Wednesday. He was only 63. He survived by 18 specialists, four health institutions, six gymnasiums, and numerous manufacturers of health foods and drugs. You see, he remembered everything, but he forgot God. He lived as though this world was all there was. And now, with many, he has to say what Jeremiah said, that the the, the, summer, the, the summer has ended, the harvest has passed, and I am not saved. Died without Christ. Don't forget there's a spiritual part of you. That God created every one of us with a spiritual hole that's only going to be filled by Him. Doesn't matter how much you go to church, doesn't matter how religious you are, doesn't matter how many good deeds you do, doesn't matter how much money you'll give away, that isn't going to fill that hole. It'll only be filled by God. In 1923, Japan was struck with an earthquake that was called at the time by the New York Tribune the greatest disaster in recorded time. Listen to the statistics. It covered 45,000 square miles. It hit five large cities with a combined population of seven million. Every building in Yokohama was destroyed. Three-fourths of Tokyo was burned. 300,000 died. And 21, I'm sorry, two and a half million people were left homeless. Disease and despair rode throughout the nation. Then help began to pour in. Most of it from, guess where? America. Food, clothing, medicine, workers by the shipload. The American Red Cross collected $10 million for the suffering Japanese. That's a lot of money in today, but that was a whole lot of money in 1923. Their newspapers in Japan carried the headlines the Japanese will never forget. Eighteen years later, December 7, 1941, they forgot. They forgot. And she bombed Pearl Harbor in a sneak attack. 
But are the Japanese the only ones that forget good things that have been done for them and to them? Say, oh, they forgot how good America was to them. Well, how often have I forgotten how good God's been to me? And the blessings that God has provided for me and the protection that God has given to me. The mercies of God. Jeremiah 2, Jeremiah tells the nation of Israel, my people have forgotten me days without number. I wonder how many days have I gone and forgotten about God. He's not been in my thoughts. Not been in my actions. After the Civil War, General Gordon was running for senator. He was a war hero. Every man in the state legislature voted for him to be nominated, except one. This man resented him for some reason, and he had served under him in the war. He rose to vote against him when he noticed the large scar on the general's face, and he was stricken with remorse. And he cried out on the floor with great emotion, I cannot vote against him. I forgot about his scar. Sometime, look at Jesus and see Him hanging on the cross. And when you're prone to forget, don't forget the scars. Don't forget the nail prints. Don't forget the piercing in His side. Don't forget the crown of thorns pressed upon His head. He was beaten in order that we might be blessed. Don't forget. Don't forget. His goodness to us. Don't forget His suffering for you and for me. When I tend to prone to get a, a situation where you have to suffer a little bit, we start complaining. I wonder some, sometimes it's it's like we 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 mentioned in Sunday school that uh, uh, Pastor uh, Steve Boots, who we supported here to start a church in Virginia, is mother about a year ago had surgery for ovarian cancer and they just got blood work this week and the cancer is back and spreading rapidly the doctor has given her six to twelve months to live nothing they can do it's all up to God now imagine a family dealing with that and and you come to them to say you know I've really really been struggling with a cold this week I really, really wish that God would just take this away from me. What do you think they'd feel like? If that was you and someone was saying that to you and it was your mom who you're battling cancer, you would say, you got no problems. You're complaining about a cold? And I wonder as Jesus looks at the scars and we come to Him complaining about things we're going through, Jesus said, did you forget what I suffered for you? And you don't think you ought to ever suffer at all for me? How easily we forget. And the command is, forget not. Forget not. The four F's of the Christian army. Fret not, fear not, faint not, and forget not. If you have these four F's, I believe your life will be richer. I believe your heart will be at rest. And I believe you will make a difference. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, take the truth now this morning. Thank you for everyone's attention today. Thank you, Lord, for these four F's of the Christian army. And Lord, while the four F would disqualify someone from our service for America, Lord, we need these four F's to be in your army. And this morning, I pray you've taken the truth to the hearts of people today. Holy Spirit, I pray you've done what only you can do. And that this morning, there'll be people who've been fretting, saying, I need to fret not. And I need to take those steps of action to give this to God. 
to know He's in control of my life. I pray, Lord, we would fear not that we would have faith in You to drive away the fear. That we would faint not. We would feed ourselves on the Word of God in time with You to give us what we need to continue. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And then, Lord, help us to forget not all your benefits, your suffering, your death on the cross, your resurrection, that we might have eternal life, that we might have victory over sin, that we might have victory over the grave, and we might have victory over death, that we might have a home in heaven one day. So many, many things you've done for us we're prone to forget. Help us to have these four F's in our life. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Let me ask this morning, how many in the room today would say, Pastor, I know if I died today that I would go to heaven. I, there's a time in my life when I know I've trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. And if I died today, I know that I'd go to heaven because my faith is in Jesus Christ as my Savior. Pastor, here's my hand as a testimony. Would you slip it up this morning that I may see it? Just put your hand up and say, that's me, Pastor. All right, you may put it down. If you're here today and would say, Pastor, I don't know for sure if I died, I'd go to heaven. But I'd like to be sure about that. I'd like to have the assurance that when I take my last breath here, my next breath will be in heaven. Would you let me pray for you this morning? Would you slip your hand up and put it back down right now and say, pray for me? Is there someone like that today? All right. The message was to believers. Are you 4F? Will you hear this morning and say, Preacher, the Lord really, the Spirit of God really dealt with my heart on a couple of those. He's really dealing with me about being a 4F Christian. I don't want to fret. I don't want to fear. I don't want to faint. And I don't want to forget. Preacher, the Lord spoke to my heart this morning. Pray for me today. Would you slip your hand up, Christian? Yes. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may put them down. In a moment I'll pray and we'll have our invitation. If you're here today and you've never received Christ as your Savior, as soon as I'm done praying, we'll stand to our feet. The pianist will begin to play. Bob will sing. Slip from your seat. Come right down here to the front. I'll meet you. And we'll have someone who's been trained take a Bible and they'll show you how you can know you're on your way to heaven. You can know Jesus Christ as your Savior. You can have God's gift of eternal life. If you're here today and you're saved and You've never maybe made a profession of faith in Christ. That's simply where you come forward and I tell the people you've accepted Christ and you're not ashamed of that decision. If you're saved and you've ever been scripturally baptized, say, preacher, I'm saved. I've asked Jesus to save me. I've never been baptized since I've been saved. Then you come. We'd be happy to help you obey the Lord in baptism. Christian, the Lord has spoken to your heart and just want to come and bow before him. Maybe some just come to say, Lord, I want to thank you. I want to remember what you've done for me. Thank you. It's that grateful heart that God's looking for. And we do that by remembering what he's done for us. Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking to hearts today. I pray that your will will be done now in this invitation time. May each individual do what you're bidding them to do in their heart. And Lord, I'll thank you for it.